Good morning, everyone. I'm Tina Kakuski, Director of Door County Library, and I would like to welcome you to the NEA Big Read, Door County. The NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. It is so exciting for Door County Reads to be a part of the NEA Big Read this year as we explore the book Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. Before we get started with the program, I have some housekeeping items to let everyone know about. This program may touch on varying points of view. We thank you for being open to hearing others' opinions and participating in intellectual freedom in a respectful manner. Please make sure you are muted at all times. We may mute you if we notice there is extra unneeded sound. Please use the chat feature to ask questions and we will go to questions and comments after the presentation this morning. We can't promise that all questions and comments will be used during this session, but we do thank you for your participation. This event includes closed captioning and live transcription. Please click the CC or closed caption symbol in the bottom tool toolbar. Then click show subtitle. This event will be available for viewing on doorcountyreads.org and on the library's YouTube channel. If you do not wish to be recorded, we suggest that you turn off your webcam. And we'd like you to get our information out there. So if you feel so inclined, use hashtag NEA Big Read. We'd appreciate that. Kagan Herringa is the program director naturalist at Crossroads at Big Creek. In the summer, she serves as instructor of environmental studies at the Interlochen Arts Camp at the Interlochen Center for the Arts. Coggin and Crossroads at Big Creek has been a vital collaborator with Door County Reads for, I think she said 11 years. And we are so happy that Coggin agreed to bring us a presentation about nature and the arts in station 11. Take it away, Coggin. Thank you. Um... Clearly, uh, what Tina said is true. Uh, I think most of you know me because I am the program director at Crossroads. But for more than 50 years now, I have spent my summers at the Interlochen Center for the Arts. So clearly, my two um, what areas of interest are nature and the arts. And in fact, it was at Interlochen that I first became familiar with this marvelous but kind of disturbing book, Station 11. Um, this is the academic library at Interlochen, and uh, here's, here's inside. And you see the, the workstation right there in the corner there, uh, right in front. That is what I call Crossroads Office Michigan Branch. That's where I spend most of my free time during the summer. And so I spend an awful lot of time in the academic library. Now, this all, I, I came to know the book the year that we were doing Celebrate Water here in Door County. And the year we were doing Celebrate Water, uh, our committee was able to talk Tina into uh, what? Choosing Death and Life of the Great Lakes for the featured read for that year. But she also wanted to pair it with a nonfiction book or a fiction book. And so I know the library staff had been looking all over the place to try to find a fiction book. They found one, it was fabulous, I read it, but it wasn't available in paperback. So when I got to camp in the summer, I realized that they didn't have a book yet and maybe I could be helpful. So I went to the librarian, and by the way, that's, a, that's kind of the secret from success. You always go to a librarian if you wanna know something. And I asked the librarian if she knew of any books that were set along Lake Michigan, uh, fiction books, please, and uh, she disappeared into the stacks and she came back very quickly with a book. And the book was a novel that had been the selection for the great Michigan reads in 2016. She said, do you like dystopian fiction? And I said, not so much. And she said, read it anyway. You know these places and you know these people. Uh, so anyway, um, I didn't have, it was a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. I didn't have any classes to teach and, and I didn't have any classes on Monday either because Interlochen is an arts institution. So we're dark on Monday. So anyway, Sunday afternoon, I started to read Station 11. 
which is a book about the collapse of civilization due to a pandemic. And um, I've talked to a lot of people who have started this book and who find it very confusing because it flips back and forth between different characters and locations and the times before and after the collapse. And quite frankly, that is a valid point. Uh, the story bounces around like a tennis ball, but every revelation in the book turns out to be connected and everything is in there for a reason. Now, I know a lot of people are still reading the book and I don't wanna be the spoiler, but I want you to understand that the book opens with Arthur who is an actor who was playing the title role in Shakespeare's King Lear, dying of a heart attack during a performance. Now, most of the characters that appear in this book before the pandemic were some way connected to Arthur and also in some way connected to the arts. Now, following the collapse, we will meet the Traveling Symphony, a troop of musicians and actors who travel along the shoreline of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron performing in the small settlements along the way. Curiously, the musicians refer to each other by their instruments and their positions. Uh, this came up in the panel discussion on Sunday afternoon, if you were there. Um, I'm gonna quote from the book. Dieter harbored serious resentment to the second horn. And she thought he was being petty, but she ranked him well below the second guitarist. The flute was less irritated by the seventh guitarist than she was by the second violin, while the viola harbored secret resentments against somebody else and so on and so forth. Someone had written, hell is other people in pen inside one of the caravans. And someone had scratched it out the word people and written in flutes. They resented each other's instruments? Really? So I closed the book that evening and I walked across campus to attend a concert of the World Youth Symphony. And there was a guest conductor that night. And you know how it is, they come out and they say all these nice things. I'm so glad to be with you. Uh, it's such an honor, wonderful young people, blah, 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 blah. And then he very seriously stopped and looked at the audience and said, don't look at the trombones. It just encourages them. Hmm. Maybe that is the way musicians think. Well, the very next morning at breakfast, the guest conductor, oh, there are the trombones. The next morning at breakfast, the uh, guest conductor sat down at my table in the uh, faculty dining room. And my friends were around the table. So they started introducing themselves. I'm the second trumpet from the San Antonio Symphony. I play bass, but I'm an instrument repair. I'm here for the Shakespeare Festival. I'm the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. I'm in fiber arts and so on and so forth. My goodness. And then the guest conductor and the whole table started in on trombones. And well, trombones and tubas and really brass aren't nearly as annoying as clavinovas. Everyone knows that. <sighs> Once breakfast was over, my friends dispersed. The artist needed to work on her project. The musicians had to practice. The guest conductor really wanted to study his score before he had to catch his plane. Um, during the kickoff dis um, discussion on Saturday, one of the panelists said that artists had a compulsion to create. Now, I'm not sure that's true, uh, but I will say, or I will at least suggest that artists have a compulsion to interpret the arts, whatever their art may be. And to do that, it takes practice. It takes technique to interpret. And so they all go to practice their arts, except for Anne, one of my friends, also known as the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. And uh, she uh, wanted to talk. She wanted to talk very much. Now, the rehearsals were going well. The director was happy with her comic timing, but she just wanted to think out loud. And so for maybe an hour, she debated with herself whether the nurse was supposed to be funny or if Shakespeare really meant her to be a mother figure, to caution Juliet, don't fall for the first man that excites you. Maybe, probably better, it's better to settle. It's better to settle for someone less exciting and maybe more stable, on and on and on and on. And sitting there over her cold coffee, I realized that in her mind, my friend Anne was the nurse 
And for Juliet's future, her decision really mattered. For my friends, for my people, art is their identity. The librarian was right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm as bad as she is. The librarian does have a name. But I know that musicians and actors, and although I'm personally not one, after working at an arts camp for 50 years, they are my people. And actually, she was right about the locations too, because Interlaken is in the lower peninsula of Michigan, exactly where this story was set. It was set in Traverse City, and then going up the bay to Petoskey, and to East Jordan, and to Mackinac City, all the places that I spend my time, I knew these places. I knew the places, I knew the people. I spent my time there. In an interview, Emily St. John Mandel said, quote, I wanted to write a love letter to the world we find ourselves in. And that she did. I finished my first reading of chapter, uh, Station 11 that day. I was in an air conditioned room with a tub and a shower and a telephone and Wi-Fi and a laundromat in the basement. And because my dorm is attached to the film studies building, a movie theater right across the hall and four concert halls within the distance of a city block. I think when I tell people I'm going to spend my summer at a camp, they don't quite picture the comfort I live in. And thinking about all these amazing conveniences that I take for granted, I was overcome, I was overcome with gratitude for the modern world. And then I was overcome with hypocrisy because in her imagination, the author created the very world that I was dreaming about. A world without water pollution or air pollution or light pollution or noise pollution. A land in which the forests were reclaiming the land and climate change was at least slowed down. And I pondered then, and I still do, would I be willing to give up the comforts of my life to attain a more environmentally friendly world? The book made a lasting impression on me. So, and then came the announcement. This year's Door County Reads, except this year it's going to be the big read. The uh, book, Station 11, was chosen actually was chosen more than a year ago before we even knew about the pandemic, but it was timely. And so consequently, during our own pandemic, I have read and reread this book several times. Now, the first thing I have to say is during the current pandemic, so far, as dreadful and as devastating and as sad as it is, and especially for those in the fine arts, it really hasn't changed my life significantly or made me any less comfortable. In fact, if you're listening today online, presumably in warm houses, wearing clean clothes and hopefully well fed and safe, you are enjoying the convenience of modern civilization. We still have our technology. And this came out loud and clear in the panel discussion, which by the way, moved me profoundly. Although I only knew one of the panelists they were discussing the arts, and for a short time, I felt like I was with my people again. Like the panelists, I find myself dividing existence between the old normal and, like them, trying to imagine what the new normal will be. So in my recent readings in the book, I find myself comparing the before and the after the pandemic. Here we see Arthur. Arthur is an actor. And Arthur, he, uh, oh my goodness, Arthur, uh, he had several wives, he had several lives, he'd grown up on an island. Another character, we have Kirsten. And Kirsten was one of three child actors who was in the play that Arthur was in. So she too had a connection to Arthur. And then we have um, Miranda, and Miranda was a, a graphic artist, and uh, she was one of Arthur's ex-wives. And 
although she had a job, a really good job, she spent all her time, all her free time, working on a comic strip called Station Eleven. So those are the characters I'd like to look at before and after the collapse. And to do that, I will want to use the words of the author. So this is just a collection of just snippets from the book that I found interesting and I felt illuminating and I thought would foster a little bit of discussion. So here we go. Here's Arthur. I've waited all of my life to be old enough to play Lear. And there's nothing I love more than being on stage. The immediacy of it. But Arthur, in his modern world, being a movie star, living in all his places, having three wives and lots of homes and being rich, he kept thinking back to his childhood. Page 55. I was thinking about the island. It all seems past tense somehow, like a dream I once had. I walk down these streets and I wander in and out of parks and I think, once I walked along the beach with my best friend B. Once I built forts with my brother in the forest. Once all I saw was trees and all those things sound false. It's like a fairy tale someone told me and I stand waiting for the light to change on the corner of Toronto and the whole place the island, I mean, it seems like a different planet. Here's another memory from Arthur. Do you remember the night we stayed up to see the comet? Comet Haikutaki, that really cold night in March with frost on the grass. I thought it was pretty, that light just hanging there in the sky. Anyway, I was thinking of it just now, and I wondered if you can remember that night as well as I do. You really can't see stars here. Page 207. And this is Miranda talking to Arthur. Why did you call me, Arthur? Her tone was as gentle as possible. You know where I come from. And she understood what he meant by this. Once we lived on an island in the ocean, once we took the ferry to go to high school and night was brilliant in the absence of all the city lights. And in these lives we've built for ourselves here in these hard and glittering cities, none of it would seem real if it weren't for you. Page 15, in the children's dressing room, Tanya was giving Kirsten a paperweight. Here, she said, as she placed it in Kirsten's hand. I'm going to keep trying to reach your parents, but just stop crying and look at this pretty thing. And Kirsten, teary-eyed and breathless, though thought that it was the most wonderful, strangest thing any person had ever given her. It was a lump of glass with a storm cloud caught inside. Page 107, this is about Miranda. She isn't sure where she stops and her job begins. Almost always she lives her life, but it is lonely. She draws stories from Station Eleven in her hotel room at night. Page 99, again about Miranda. She likes Hollywood best at night in the quiet when it's all dark leaves and shadows and night blooming flowers. The edges soften, gently lit streets curving up the hills. And this is a quote from the comic book. I stood looking over my jammage world and I tried to forget the sweetness of life on earth. Station 11, page 42. Now we're going to change. I'd like to read some quotes about post-collapse from the book Station 11. What was lost in the collapse? Almost everything. Almost everyone. 
but there is still such beauty. Page 48. A deer crossed the road ahead and paused to look at them before it vanished into the trees. The beauty of this world where almost everyone was gone. If hell is other people, what is a world with almost no people in it? Perhaps soon humanity would simply flicker out. But Kirsten found this thought more peaceful than sad. So many species that appeared and later vanished from the earth. What was one more? How many people were there left now? The Traveling Symphony, page 58. All three caravans of the Traveling Symphony was labeled as such. The Traveling Symphony lettered in white on both sides, but the lead caravan carries the additional title of the text, Because Survival is Insufficient. Page 47. This collection of petty jealousies, neuroses, undiagnosed PTSD case, shimmering resentments, living together, traveling together, rehearsed together, performed together 365 days of the year, permanent company, permanent tour. But what made it bearable were the friendships. Of course, the camaraderie and the music and the Shakespeare and the moments of transcendent beauty and joy when it didn't matter who used the last of the rosin on their bow or who helps who slept with other people. Although someone, probably Sayed, had said, hell is other people. And someone had, else had scratched out other people and substituted flutes. Hell is other actors, Kristen said, also ex-boyfriends. Stick to musician. I think we're generally saner. Page 37. The traveling symphony moves between settlements of the changing world and had been doing so since five years after the collapse when the conductor gathered a few of her friends. The symphony performed music and Shakespeare. They had performed modern plays sometimes in the first few years, but what was startling, what no one could have anticipated was that audiences seemed to prefer Shakespeare to their other theatrical offerings. People wanted what was best about the world, Dieter said. Page 119. Sometimes the traveling symphony thought that what they were doing was noble. There were moments around the campfire when someone would say something invigorating about the importance of art and everyone would find it easier to sleep that night. Other times it seemed like a difficult and dangerous way to survive. Page 134. The first watch was going to sleep. They had nothing to report. Just trees and owls. Kirsten was alone with August. They circled the road and listening and watching for movements, cloud break apart to reveal the stars overhead, a brief flare of a meteor, or perhaps a falling satellite, a forest filled with small noises, rainwater dripping from the trees, the movement of animals, a light breeze. The audience rose for a standing ovation Kirsten stood in a state of suspension that always came over her at the end of performances, a sense of having flown very high and landed in completely, her soul pulling her upward. The paperweight was a smooth lump of glass with storm clouds in it, about the size of a plum. It was of no practical use whatsoever. Nothing but dead weight in the bag, but she found it beautiful. The more you remember, the more you've lost. Emily St. John Mendel, Station 11. At some undetectable cue, 
the musicians stopped practicing and tuning and talking among themselves and took their places with their backs to the water and fell silent. And a hush came over the assembled crowd. The conductor stepped forward, smiled at the assembled audience and bowed, turned without a word to face the musicians in the bay. A seagull glided overhead. The conductor raised her baton. Page 251. Uh, it's not your imagination. They were helping build a bonfire with branches someone had dragged in from the woods. She explained it to him. One of the great scientific questions of Galileo's time was whether the Milky Way was made up of individual stars. Imagine even to imagine this being a question in the age of electricity. The night awash with the light of Galileo's age, and it was awash with the light now. The era of light pollution had come to an end. The increasing brilliance meant the grid was failing, darkness pooling over the earth. I was here for the end of electricity. The thought sent shivers up Clark's spine. I stood looking over my damaged home and tried to forget the sweetness of life on earth. So what's sweet? What's not sweet? What do we long for? I long to go back to Interlochen, <laughs> but I'm looking at my life here in Door County right now and thinking about what I have. I have nature. I have it all the time. And I have technology. I have internet. I can listen to music. I can have uh, I can have all the food I want. I can go to the grocery store. I can talk to people through chat. I can talk to people on a Zoom meeting. I have technology. I have all the comforts I need. And I have nature. But I long for the sweetness of earth. I long for the temporal arts. Do you know what the temporal arts are? Um, I think the best example of it is coming up in a couple of weeks when Sturgeon Bay celebrates fire on ice. There is nothing so temporal in art as an ice sculpture. Once the sculpture is there and after a couple of days, it simply melts away into nothing. But the truth is all live performance is temporal art. It happens in the moment. It happens with the interactions between the performers. It happens with the electricity between the performers and the audience. Any artist will tell you that no performance is the same. It is temporal art. And even if you record it, it's not the same. I was at the live performance at um, Northern Skies when they formed Guys on Ice. And it was magical. And I've seen the recording. I've, I have the DVD. I've seen it on TV. It's not the same. What I miss more than anything, I think, is temporal art. The art where you're in the moment, where you're sharing, where you're collaborating, where you're making your art, where you're sharing your art. That's what I miss. In the book, in the pandemic, before the pandemic, in fact, when Arthur and Miranda and Kirsten were in Toronto, they had temporal art. They were doing their art. They were on stage. They were performing in front of an audience. But what did they yearn for? What did they have missing from their life? Where did they get their solace? They thought back to life with nature. In modern times, when we have technology, when we have all the things we have, when we have all the comfort, where do we, what do we long for? What do we yearn after? And it's my opinion, we long for nature. If there could possibly be a silver lining to our current pandemic, is that more people are spending time outside, that they're getting their solace from nature. That's what we learn, yearn for. That is the sweetness of earth. And then I think of after 
after the collapse. My goodness, after the collapse, these people were living in nature. They had nature all around them. They, nature was dangerous. Nature was always there. They did not need to yearn for nature. What did they learn yearn for? They yearn for technology. They yearn for comforts. They wanted to go back to the normal. They wanted to go back to the new normal. And this came up in the, the, the uh, panel discussion we had the other day on Saturday. They were talking about technology. And at the end of the, of the book, when Kirsten goes up and looks over the, the thing and sees the grid of electric lights in a faraway town, and somebody said civilization had returned. Was it civilization? Or was she longing for the return of technology? Because even during the collapse, the 20 years that the symphony was traveling, they had the camaraderie of performance. They had each other. They had the arts. They had music. They had art. So here I am in the middle of the pandemic, and I'm, I'm longing to go back to Interlochen. I'm longing to see my students. I'm longing to go to a live concert. I'm longing to hear the children sing. And after the children sing, I want to give each and every one of them a hug, touching them and holding them. And one of the songs my students sang at the last concert I heard them sing was a German folk song. All things shall perish from under the sky. Music alone shall live. Music alone shall live never to die. Thank you. Thank you, Coggin. What a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm looking at our chat right now to see if we have any questions or if you'd like to put a question into the chat at this point, um, we'd be happy to uh, direct that to Coggin so that she can answer or comments also. She she mentioned comments were okay. So anybody at all? I'm not seeing any at this point, but let me just check here. Morgan, you can check for this too to make sure I'm looking in the right place. Oh, here we go. Um, Coggin, do you have hope that temporal art will return soon? <laughs> yes. Yes, my vaccine is scheduled for February 17th. <laughs> but yes, um, I, I, I so admire our arts community right now that they've been able to give us digital art. But I can hardly wait. I, I think temporal art will return. I'm not sure it will be in the same form. And in fact, I think, and I know this for Crossroads, I hope to be able to have lectures and programs at Crossroads, but I think we will probably now broadcast them digitally also. I don't think and I don't think the new normal will be the same as the old or um, not normal. I really don't. I think it might actually be enhanced because of what we've learned. I know that some things that are the artistic world is doing um, is putting their art onto the um, internet. I know that isn't temporal art, but it is art that people at least can access from their homes. Um, one of the items that we have going uh, over the next couple of weeks is the Museum of Civilization. And if you remember from the book that was uh, at the airport, uh, mm -hmm. people would drop off items that reminded them of the past or that they missed. And we're doing two different kinds of Museum of Civilizations here. One is at the Miller Art Museum, which of course is within the um, Door County Library Surgeon Bay building. Um, and you can get an appointment to go and look at an exhibit that they have, a pop-up exhibit that they have of art that is inspired by Station Eleven. So that is an opportunity to see art in person. You just need to have an appointment by calling the Miller Art Museum uh, to do that. And then another uh, Museum of Civilization that we have uh, is an online one where you send us items in uh, the form of audio or uh, visual, like a picture that are things you would miss if they were not available to you uh, at this time. So 
Hagen, what do you think about the Museum of Civilization? Um, am I, um, I think it's wonderful, but I do want to make a statement about the visual arts. Um, I, I know there's such a thing as performance art, and I've seen it, it's lovely. Um, but anytime I go to an art museum or when I go to an art opening or when I go to an art opening at, at Interlochen, I really like the standing with somebody else and talking about the art. And when I go to an art museum, I always try to get a docent led tour and have the docent tell us what they know about the background of the artist and what the artist was saying to us and why the artist did what they did. And I, I, I don't get that. I, you know, I want to see, I want to see the brush strokes. I want to feel them, uh, not feel them, but I want to see them close enough that I can see them. And I want to have a docent tell me her interpretation or his interpretation. And then the people who are with me, I want to hear what they think about it because the whole idea of any art is interpretation and communication. And so what the artist is thinking, I want it interpreted for me. I want to share it. So even visual art, I think needs to have some performance in it. Good point. I, I agree 100%. The Museum of Civilization that is in the Miller Art Museum, since that is by appointment, you will have somebody there with you that you can ask questions about the art. It's not quite the same as a docent led thing, but at least it's what we're trying to do um, in the circumstances we're in. Uh, let me just check here uh, for questions. A question for Coggin. Um, have people been attending the outdoor activities at Crossroads, like the runs and cross country skiing, also the rocks that people are painting and leaving along the trails? Um, yes, we, we have probably three times more visitors to our outside programs than we ever had before. Our, our virtual run, that was an amazing thing. Uh, we realized right away that if we had a normal run with people crowded together at the starting line and people hugging each other at the finish line, we would be truly a super spreader. So we, we had a run where we said, run the distance at a distance. And many of the people actually did come out to Crossroads and ran the distance there, but we had people all over the country running the distance and sending them um, pictures of themselves. So there was one guy in the Adirondacks and there was one person in Arizona and we had people all over the country participating. But was it the same? No. Um, at Christmas time, we wanted to do something for Christmas. So we had a, a candlelight walk and we had the people go out and walk the trails, but we only let them go every five, uh, two minutes so they wouldn't have interactions and they wouldn't spread. And it was lovely, but it wasn't the same as if people could have been in the parking lot greeting each other and hugging each other and being a community. So yes, we have outdoors. Yes, we have a lot of people coming. We actually have people using Crossroads as a place to meet, but is it the same as when we have a lecture and we go into the lab and, and have refreshments and, and talk? And I, I always joke to our, our um, housekeeping lady that I can always tell if the people at a program like each other because of the spills. If, if people are just there and eat the refreshments and go back into the lecture hall, okay, fine. But if they're friends, they're hugging each other and they're talking with their hands and they're, and we have stuff all over the floor. We don't have stuff on the floor anymore. It's not the same. I think what you're talking about there too is one, one of the reasons that the traveling symphony is together. Don't you think that they are people that want to be together and want to experience uh, creating music and theater together in a, in a time um, in the book when uh, that's not very possible to do because of the numbers of people, but they have a sense of community. And I think that that's, that was a, a really good point that the author brought in there too, is that the sense of community is what people lost um, in the book too. So yeah, love that point. Yeah, Al although I have to say, you know, people did make settlements. Yeah. And I, I remember one scene where a guy reached the airport and with tears in his eyes because he thought he was the only person left. Can you imagine being the only person left? I mean, it's bad enough that we can't hug each other. What if you were the only person? Yeah. The book really makes you think, doesn't it? Um, the earth was sweet. It makes it yearn for before, doesn't it? And really, you know, I, I thought when I first read the book, it was a stupid name for the title. 
<laughs> it was so dumb. There were so many things she could have called it. But when I read, you know, Station 11, the people were yearning for the world that they had left and wanting so much to go back. And so that was the right title. Hagen, what do you think about the ending where they see uh, lights in the distance? Um, I, hopeful, hopeful. There are still books, people can still learn. Uh, I think they probably were able to reassemble civilization as they knew it. Maybe not fast, but I think they could put it together. But 20 years out, and they kept talking about the children who, who didn't remember the past. Who were the children? Did they remember? Are there enough people that remembered the past that they could recreate it? And I don't know. Might be different. Oh, new normal in our world and in Emily St. John Mandel's world. New normal will not be the same. True. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments for Coggin? We're happy to take them. We have time to do that. Nothing is out on Facebook, thank you. Um, but in Zoom, if you have a, one last comment or anything you'd like to ask Coggin about. Great idea for the, the discussion, Coggin, and the presentation about nature and the arts in Station 11. It really I, I, I will tell you, I will confess, Tina, that I, oh, yeah, nature and the arts, because that's what I remembered from my first reading. And then during my second reading, that's not what it's about. Hmm. It's, it's, it's not about yearning for nature. In the book, they had nature. It was yearning for the technology and yearning for the community. So when I agreed to use nature and the arts as my topic, I had no idea what I was talking about. And I kind of changed, I learned a lot. I learned a lot reading and re-reading this book, not just about the world, but about myself. I agree on my second reading of it too, so much more spoke to me in the book than the first time, definitely. A little bit of time for questions or comments. If you have any, we'd be happy to take them. Well, thank you, Coggin, so much. Oh, wait. Well, oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Sure to get some. Doesn't our perspective change based on experiences in time? What do you think? I, I think absolutely. And then another question came up about the prophet, and that was that was a an interesting discussion during the panel discussion. Um, the young man was very much influenced by his mother, who believed everything was predestined and happened for a reason. And so I'm sure, you know, they say as as a twig is bent, so grows the tree. Kirsten grew up in the arts, and even though she didn't remember them, she was she was. The arts were a part of her and they were what she did. On the other hand, um, the prophet, Tyler, was influenced by his mother who believed everything was there for a purpose. And although they were the same age and they, he had the same father that was her sort of spiritual father, they diverged greatly because of how they were raised. Mm. Interesting. Um, so another comment here is that I hear that many did not like the choice of the book this year. And why do you think that is? Um, why do I think that is? I don't have an opinion. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. I think even when we have books that uh, people diverge on whether they like it or not, that's kind of the point of reading the book too is so that we can have really good discussions about those reasons. Um, and this book, I think, gives us those reasons. Uh, so I really look forward to uh, seeing uh, what happens at the book discussions. Um, there's many book discussions coming up, by the way, and they're at different times and different days. Um, if you go to doorcountyreads.org, 
and look at the calendar of events, you'll see that there's tons of book discussions. I think there's about eight of them coming up over the next two weeks. So I expect that there will be uh, voices at the book discussions that did not like the book. And there'll be some that did really like the book. And that's true of any book, you know? So um, this, as Coggin mentioned earlier, uh, this book was chosen or talked about years ago. So it's just that it happened to line up with what's going on in our world. That is a total coincidence. And uh, who knew that that would be the case? But um, yeah, we, we do choose and talk about these years in advance um, and why we didn't do it a few years ago. We had other things on the agenda, as Coggin mentioned, we participated with Celebrate Water. So um, that was the book for that year. And then we finally were able to uh, make this happen. And some of you know that being part of the NEA Big Read is um, uh, applying for an, a, a grant award to be, to be part of the NEA Big Read. So when we were doing the applying, uh, the current pandemic that the, we're all living through um, was not even on our radar hardly, uh, anybody's radar, at least in the United States. So total coincidence, totally unintentional and gives us a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss. What do you think, Coggin? Would we have some lively discussions coming up? I hope so, because I'm going to participate. I, I can't drop this now. I, I've yeah. been living the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's it for our questions now. Um, but thank you, Coggin, for the informative, interesting presentation and the good talk afterwards. We really liked it. Um, some of you may not have read Station 11, although I think most of you probably have. There's more copies floating around. So if you know somebody who needs a copy, go ahead and call your local uh, Door County Library branch and see if they have some. I think there are some out there available. Um, you can also find it as an ebook or an audiobook um, on Overdrive. And tonight, the Peninsula Players are doing a play reading at 7 p.m. Um, to access that, it's free, of course, but you do need to go to peninsulaplayers.com to get tickets. The tickets are free, but that's the way you would access the play. And then on Friday, uh, another play reading of one, another group uh, that is with us from year to year with Door County Reads is the Third Avenue Playhouse. They'll be doing uh, a play reading of the children. That's at 7 p.m. on Friday. And again, you need to go to their website, thirdavenueplayhouse.com to find the way to get the tickets. These are both relatively easy ways to get the tickets. They're just different from each other. So please check that out. Um, and remember that all of our events uh, for the next two weeks are virtual. So um, please go to our doorcountyreads.org site to find information about when they are and, and the links are there to click in to access them. Um, and in addition, don't forget those book discussions because that's where we get to talk about every little bit about this book, um, pro and con and what you did and didn't like and how it fits into our world today. So um, I wanna thank you all for being a part of the discussion of uh, the Big Read, NEA Big Read, Door County. And Coggin, any final thoughts before we sign off here? Uh, just thank you for involving me. This has been, it's been a pleasure. And it's been a pleasure to have you uh, again this year for sure. So we look forward to seeing you all at other events over the next two weeks. And we'll say goodbye for now and have a great day, everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.